The next day, more carts rolled up the hill and still more carts. There might have been some grumbling about dealing locally, but that very week orders began to pour out of Bag End for every kind of provision, commodity, or luxury that could be attained in Hobbiton or the Bywater or anywhere in the neighborhood. People became enthusiastic and they began to tick off the days on the calendar and they watched eagerly for the postman hoping for invitations. Before long, the invitations began pouring out and the Hobbiton post office was blocked and the Bywater post office was snowed under and voluntary assistant postmen were called for. There was a constant stream of them going up the hill, carrying hundreds of polite variations on thank you, I shall certainly come. A notice appeared on the gate at the bag end, no admittance except on party business. Even those who had or pretended to have party business were seldom allowed inside. Bilbo was busy writing invitations, taking off answers, packing up presents, and making some private preparations of his own. From the time of Gandalf's arrival, he remained hidden from view. One morning, the hobbits woke to find a large field south of Bilbo's front door, covered with ropes and poles for tents and pavilions. A special entrance was cut into the bank leading to the road, and wide steps and a large white gate were built there. The three hobbit families of Bagshot Row, adjoining the field, were intensely interested and generally envied. Old Gaffer Gamgee stopped even pretending to do his garden. The tents began to go up. There was a specially large pavilion so big that the tree that grew in the field was right before it and stood proudly near one end. At the head of the chief table, lanterns were hung on all its branches, more promising still to the hobbit's mind. An enormous open-air kitchen was erected in the north corner of the field, a draft of cooks from every inn and eating house for miles around arrived to supplement the dwarves and other odd folk that were quartered at Bag End. Excitement rose to its height. And then the weather clouded over. That was on Wednesday, the eve of the party. Anxiety was intense. And then Thursday. September the 22nd actually dawned. The sun got up, the clouds vanished, flags were unfurled, and the fun began. Bilbo Baggins called it a party, but it was really a variety of entertainments rolled into one. Practically everybody living near was invited. A very few were overlooked by accident, but as they turned up all the same, that did not matter. Many people from other parts of the Shire were also asked, and there was even a few from outside the borders. Bilbo met the guests and additions at the new white gate in person. He gave away presents to all and sundry. The latter were those who went out again by the back way and came in again by the gate. Hobbits give presents to other people on their own birthdays, not very expensive ones as a rule, and not so lavishly as on this bywater occasion. But it was not a bad system. Actually, in Hobbiton and bywater, every day the year was somebody's birthday, so that every hobbit in those parts had a fair chance of at least one present at least once a week but they never got tired of them. On this occasion, the presents were usually good. The hobbit children were so excited that for a while they almost forgot about eating. There were toys the like of which they had never seen before. 
all beautiful and some obviously magical. Many of them had indeed been ordered a year before and had come all the way from the mountain and from Dale and were of real dwarf make. When every guest had been welcomed and was finally inside the gate, there were songs, dances, music, games, and, of course, food and drink. There were three official meals, lunch, tea, and dinner, or supper. But lunch and tea were marked chiefly by the fact that at those times all the guests were sitting down and eating together. At other times, there were merely lots of people eating and drinking continuously from 11s until 6.30, when the fireworks started. The fireworks were by Gandalf. They were not only brought by him, but designed and made by him. And the special effects set pieces and flights of rockets were let off by him. But there was also a generous distribution of squibs, crackers, back wrappers, sparklers, torches, dwarf candles, elf fountains, goblin barkers, and thunderclaps. They were all superb. The art of Gandalf improved with age. There were rockets like a flight of scintillating birds singing with sweet voices. There were green trees with trunks of dark smoke. Their leaves opened like a whole spring unfolding in a moment, and their shining bran branches dropped glowing flowers down upon the astonished hobbits, disappearing with a sweet scent just before they touched their upturned faces. There were fountains of butterflies, that flew glittering into the trees. There were pillars of colored fires that rose and turned into eagles or sailing ships or flanks of flying swans. There was a red thunderstorm and a shower of yellow rain. There was a forest of silver spears that sprang suddenly into the air with a yell like an embattled army and came down again into the water with a hiss like a hundred hot snakes. And there was also one last surprise in honor of Bilbo, and it started the hobbits exceedingly. As Gandalf intended, the lights went out, a great smoke went up. It shaped itself like a mountain scene in the distance, and began to glow at the summit. It sprouted green and scarlet flames. Out flew a red golden dragon, not life-size, but terribly lifelike. Fire came from his jaws. His eyes glared down. There was a roar, and he whizzed three times over the heads of the crowd. They all ducked, and many fell flat on their faces. The dragon passed like an express train, turned somersault and burst over Bywater with a deafening explosion. And that is the signal for supper, said Bilbo. The pain and alarm vanished at once, and the prostrate hobbits leaped to their feet. There was a splendid supper for everyone, for everyone that is except those invited to the specially famil family dinner party. This was held in the great pavilion with the tree. The invitations were limited to twelve dozen, a number also called by the hobbits one gross. Though the word was not considered proper to use of people, and the guests were selected from all the families to which Bilbo and Frodo were related, with the addition of a few special unrelated friends, such as Gandalf. Many hobbits were included, and present by parental permission, for hobbits were easygoing with their children in the manner of sitting up late, especially when there was a chance of getting them a free meal. 
bringing up young hobbits took a lot of provender. There were many bagginses and boffins, and also many tooks and brandy bucks. There were various grubs, relation of Bilbo Baggins' grandmother, and various chubs, connections of his took grandfather, and a selection of burroses, bulgers, brace girdles, rock houses, good bodies, horn blowers, and proudfoots. Some of these were only very distant connected to, with Bilbo, and some had hardly ever been to Hobbiton before, as they lived in remote corners of the Shire. The Sackville Bagginses were not forgotten. Otho and his wife Lobelia were present. They disliked Bilbo and detested Frodo, but so magnificent was the invitation card, written in gold and ink, that they had felt it was impossible to refuse. Besides, their cousin, Bilbo, had been specializing in food for many years, and his table had a high reputation. All the 144 guests expected a pleasant feast, though they rather dreaded the after-dinner speech of their host, an inevitable item. He was liable to drag in bits of what he called poetry, and sometimes, after a glass or two, would allude to the absurd adventures of his mysterious journey. The guests were not disappointed. They had a very pleasant feast, in fact, an engrossing entertainment, rich, abundant, varied, and prolonged. The purchase of provisions fell almost to nothing throughout the district in the ensuing weeks, but as Bilbo's catering had depleted the stocks of most of the stores, cellars, and warehouses for miles around, that did not much matter. After the feast, more or less, came the speech. Most of the company were, however, now in a tolerant mood at that delightful stage which they called filling up the corners. They were sipping their favorite drinks and nibbling at their favorite dainties, and their fears were forgotten. They were prepared to listen to anything and to cheer at every full stop. My dear people, began Bilbo, rising in his place. Hear, hear, hear. They shouted and kept on repeating it in chorus, seeming reluctant to follow their own advice. Bilbo left his place and went and stood on a chair under the illuminated tree. The light of the lanterns fell on his beaming face. The golden buttons shone on his embroidered silk waistcoat. They could all see him standing, waving one hand in the air, and the other was in his trouser pocket. My dear Bagginses and Boffins, he began again, and my dear Tooks and Brandy Bucks and Grubs and Chubs and Burroses and Hornblowers and Bulgers and brace girdles, good bodies, brock houses, and proud foots. Proud feet, shouted an elderly hobbit from the back of the pavilion. His name, of course, was Proudfoot, and well merited. His feet were large, exceptionally furry, and both were on the table. Proudfoots, repeated Bilbo. Also, my good Sackville Bagginses, that I welcome back at last to Bag End. Today is my 111th birthday. And I am 11 today. Hurrah, hurrah! Many happy returns, they shouted, and they hammered joyously on the tables. Bilbo was doing splendidly. This was the sort of stuff they liked, short and obvious. I hope you are all enjoying yourselves as much as I am. Deafening cheers, cries of yes and no. 
noises of trumpets and horns, pipes and flutes, and other musical instruments. There were, as had been said, many young hobbits present. Hundreds of musical crackers had been pulled. Most of them bore the mark of Dale on them, which did not convey much to most of the hobbits, but they all agreed they were marvelous crackers. They contained instruments, small, but of perfect make and enchanting tones. Indeed, in one corner of the young Tooks and Brandy Bucks, supposing Uncle Bilbo to have finished, since he had plainly said all that was necessary, now got up an impromptu orchestra and began a merry dance tune. Master Everard Took and Miss Milio Brandybuck got on the table and with bells in their hands began to dance the Springle Ring, a pretty dance, but rather vigorous. But Bilbo had not finished. Seizing a horn from a youngster nearby, he blew three loud hoots. The noise subsided. I shall not keep you long, he cried. Cheers from all the assembly. I have called you all together for a purpose. Something in the way that he said this made an impression. There was almost silence, and one or two of the tooks pricked up their ears. Indeed, for three purposes, first of all to tell you that I am immensely fond of you all, and that eleventy-one years is too short a time to live among such excellent and admirable hobbits. Tremendous outburst of approval. I don't know half of you half as well as I should like, and I like less than half of you half as well as you deserve. This was unexpected and rather difficult. There was some scattered clapping, but most of them were trying to work it out and see if it came to a compliment. Secondly, to celebrate my birthday, cheers again, I should say our birthday, for it is, of course, also the birthday of my heir and nephew Frodo. He comes of age and into his inheritance today. Some perfunctory clapping by the elders and some loud shouts of Frodo, Frodo, jolly old Frodo from the juniors. The Sackville Bagginson scowled and wondered what was meant by coming into his inheritance. Together we score 144. Your numbers were chosen to fit this remarkable total. One gross, if I may use the expression, no cheers. This was ridiculous. Many of the guests, and especially the Sackville Bagginses, were insulted. Feeling sure they had only been asked to fill up the required number, like goods in a package. <laughs> One gross indeed, a vulgar expression. It is also, if I may be allowed to refer to ancient history, the anniversary of my arrival by Beryl at Eskarath on the Long Lake, though the fact that it was my birthday slipped my memory on that occasion. I was only 51 then, and birthdays did not seem so important. The banquet was very splendid, however, though I had a bad cold at the time. I remember and could only say, thank you very much. I now repeat it more correctly, thank you very much for coming to my little party. Obstinate silence. They all feared that a song or some poetry was now imminent, and they were getting bored. Why couldn't he stop talking and let them drink to his health? But the Bilbo did not sing or recite. He paused for a moment. Thirdly, 
And finally, he said, I wish to make an announcement. He spoke this last word so loudly and suddenly that everyone <coughs> sat up who could still. I regret to announce that though, as I said, 11 years is far too short a time to spend among you, this is the end. I am going. I am leaving now. Goodbye. He stepped down and vanished. There was a blinding flash of light, and the guests all blinked. When they opened their eyes, Bilbo was nowhere to be seen. One hundred and forty-four flabbergasted hobbits sat back speechless. Old Odo Proudfoot removed his feet from the table and stamped. There was a dead silence until suddenly... After several deep breaths, every Baggins, Boffin, Took, Brandybuck, Grub, Chub, Burrows, Bulger, Brace Girdle, Brock House, Goodbody, Runeblower, and Proudfoot began to talk at once. It was generally agreed that the joke was in very bad taste, and more food and drink were needed to cure the guests of shock and annoyance. He's mad. I always said so, was probably the most popular comment. Even the Tooks, with a few exceptions, thought Bilbo's behavior was absurd. For the moment, most of them took it for granted that his disappearance was nothing more than a ridiculous prank. But old Ururi Brandybuck was not so sure. Neither age nor enormous dinner had clouded his wits, and he said to his daughter-in-law, Esmeralda, There is something fishy in this, my dear. I believe that the Mad Baggins is off again. Silly old fool, but why worry? He hasn't taken the victuals with him. He called loudly to Frodo to send the wine round again. Frodo was the only one present who had said nothing. For some time he had sat silent beside Bilbo's empty chair and ignored all remarks and questions. He had enjoyed the joke, of course, even though he had been in the know. He had difficulty in keeping from laughter at the indignant surprise of the guests, but at the same time he felt deeply troubled he realized suddenly that he loved the old hobbit dearly. Most of the guests went on eating and drinking and discussing Bilbo Baggins' oddities, past and present. But the Sackville Bagginses had already departed in wrath. Frodo did not want to have any more to do with the party. He gave orders for more wine to be served, then he got up and drained his own glass silently to the health of Bilbo, and stepped out of the pavilion. As for Bilbo Baggins, even while he was making his speech, he had been fingering the golden ring in his pocket, his magic ring that he had kept secret for so many years. As he stepped down, he slipped it on his finger, and he was never seen by any hobbit in Hobbiton again. He walked briskly back to his hole and stood for a moment listening with a smile to the din in the pavilion and to the sounds of the merrymaking in other parts of the field. And then he went in. He took off his party clothes, folded up and wrapped in tissue paper, his embroidered silk waistcoat, and put it away. And then he put on quickly some old untidy garments and fastened round his waist a worn leather belt. On it he hung a short sword in a battered black leather scabbard. From a locked drawer, smelling of mothballs, he took out an old cloak and hood. They had been locked up as if they were very precious, but they were so patched and weather-stained that their original color could hardly be guessed. It might have been dark green, they were rather too large for him. He then went into his study and from a large strong box took out a bundle wrapped in old clothes. 
in the leather-bound manuscript, and also a large, bulky envelope. The book and bundle he stuffed into the top of a heavy bag and was standing there, already nearly full. Into the envelope, he slipped his golden ring and its fine chain, and then sealed it and addressed it to Frodo. At first, he put it on the mantelpiece, but suddenly he removed it and stuck it in his pocket. That moment, the door opened and Gandalf came quickly in. Hello, said Bilbo. I wondered if you would turn up. I am glad to find you visible, replied the wizard, sitting down in the chair. I wanted to catch you and have a few final words. I suppose you feel that everything has gone off splendidly and according to plan? Yes, I do, said Bilbo. Though that flash was surprising, it quite startled me, let alone the others. A little addition of your own, I suppose. It was. You have wisely kept the ring all these years, and it seemed to me necessary to give your guests something else that would seem to explain your sudden vanishment. And would spoil my joke. You are an interfering old busybody, laughed Bilbo, but I expect you know best, as usual. I do, when I know anything. But I don't feel too sure about this whole affair. It has now come to the final point. You have had your joke and alarmed or offended most of your relations and given the whole shire something to talk about for nine days. Or ninety-nine more likely. Are you going any further? Yes, I am. I feel I need a holiday, a very long holiday. As I have told you before, probably a permanent holiday. I don't expect I shall return. In fact, I don't mean to. And I have made all arrangements. I am old, Gandalf. I don't look it, but I am beginning to feel it in my heart of hearts. Well preserved indeed, he snorted. Why, I feel all thin, sort of stretched, if you know what I mean like butter that has been scraped over too much bread. That can't be right. I need a change or something. Gandalf looked curiously and closely at him. No, it does not seem right, he said thoughtfully. No, after all, I believe your plan is probably the best. Well, I've made up my mind anyway. I want to see mountains again, Gandalf, mountains and then find somewhere where I can rest, in peace and quiet, without a lot of relatives prying around, a string of confounded visitors hanging on the bell. I might find somewhere where I can finish my book. I have thought of a nice ending for it, and he lived happily ever after to the end of his days. Gandalf laughed. I hope he will. But nobody will read the book, however it ends. Oh, they may, in years to come. Frodo has read some already, as far as it has gone. You'll keep an eye on Frodo, won't you? Yes, I will. Two eyes, as often as I can spare them. 